opportunity for us to talk about teaching and engagement for the collaboration um, in healthcare. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about how you have to be a part of a healthcare team for patient centered care. So today we have the opening address. It will be delivered by Mary <coughs> Ebony. She's the director of telehealth with Nebraska Medicine. And then, of course, on tomorrow, we will have several guest speakers lined up for you. And we'll go from about 11.30 tomorrow until 3.30 in the afternoon. So please feel free to stop in and join us. But again, I'd like to welcome you to the second annual Beacom HSAD Tech Days. And we're going to now have our opening address by Mary Debney. Great, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm glad to, to be here with you guys today. Um, as I said, my name is Mary Devaney, and uh, I also am a USD grad, and I'm also in my master's program, as I was actually just in a, a class with Dr. Shepard, and uh, as I, my husband kind of made me understand here just last night, he goes, yeah, you're, because I'm graduating in May, so for my master's, and he says, yeah, you're in your senioritis stage, aren't you? And I'm like, oh, I can't wait to be done. So. Um, I can appreciate kind of, uh, especially now that the, sun, the sun's out and the, uh, the weather is finally nice, we're all kind of going, ah, oh, it's time. So I'm excited to be here and kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, the, kind of the world and the, the concept of, of telehealth um, and really kind of how it all kind of plays together across really all aspects of healthcare in general. So kind of, I always like to start out with uh, kind of a, a level setting of what is the term telehealth. Outside of this class did before, had you heard of that term? Okay, not, not everybody, but, but uh, many. And that's, that's great, because I think it's becoming more and more um, familiar to people. But I think it's important to understand, too, that, that the term kind of goes back and forth depending upon who you're talking to. And so today, when I say telehealth, I, I, I'm talking more from the umbrella term perspective of things, under which, uh, under which uh, there's a variety of different aspects. So the telemedicine uh, would be a, a piece of that, and that is uh, really where it's talking about the clinical services, where it's a uh, provider to a patient. Um, there's also remote monitoring, that's often nurse-driven care, uh, nurse-coordinated care. Uh, we have store and forward, which is often uh, kind of equated to uh, elaborate email or but it's mostly image sharing things like um, uh, teleradiology telepathology those types of things are, are under that uh, topic but then we're also moving into the things that are kind of considered um, more current and that would be direct to consumer or primary care focused um, telehealth activities and we'll kind of go into more of that later and then of course the app space or mobile health is the other uh, piece of things but all of that falls under the, the, the term telehealth. And that's where it can get kind of confusing when you're talking to people because their terms don't always blend. And so make sure that when you're visiting with somebody or you're asking questions or they're asking you questions, level set with them is what do you mean by telehealth? Because it can be, it can be different for different people. But most importantly, understanding that telehealth is a tool. It's not a different kind of care. It's not a specialty care. It is a tool in the delivery of healthcare, and so um, that's an important piece to, to understand. So it's and it's at a distance, but that distance can be across the state, across the country, or across the street. And so I think that's an important piece to, to understand. Tele is just the application of technology in that in that care delivery. Basically, providing care at a, at a distance, whatever distance that may be. And so, it's, you may think telehealth, since it's kind of a fairly new term, um, that it hasn't been around that long. Well, I hate to say it, but it has been, um, because I was kind of involved at, at the very beginning of it all. Um, it's been around for 20 plus years. Um, yes, I hate to say that. Um, but it's it's really at that time it was the the very very rudimentary telemedicine. We uh, had the technology that we used as the, the typical video conferencing. Um, they were, as, as you may recall, TV monitors were really big boxes at one time. And I was pushing carts from that were weighed more than I did down the hall of the hospital from one room to the other. Uh, and so that, I mean, those were the kinds of technology that we were working with. And it was trying to be creative uh, and 
the focus being on how do we serve those really <coughs> rural patients. I mean, that was really where the primary focus started. So things have kind of changed since then. Uh, we certainly have, um, you know, technology has certainly changed. We, all, we carry a lot of that in our pocket now. Um, but some of, the, uh, some of the things have not, some of the, the focuses have not changed. I mean, certainly we have an understanding uh, of technology and how it can be used in our day-to-day. -day. <coughs> we, we do it, we FaceTime with friends, we Skype with family. We, you know, there are things that we do today that is just second nature, where it wasn't at the time when we first started out. We also are seeing increased needs. There's a lot of uh, disparity in, in health care, in, in access to care. Those things continue to be there. Expectations from patients and families can continue to, to shift in that they too understand what technology can do for them. And they are starting to ask for their providers, why can't I do this? Can't I do that? because they know what the technology is capable of doing. We still have some of the same issues that we've been dealing with over the last many years. There still is a lack of access for needed services. We've got um, you know, just a few locations in South Dakota where specialists really live. Um, Sioux Falls or Rapid City. There's a whole lot of state in between there that is, is uh, challenged with access to specialty services. Uh, and so how do, we, how do we address that? And so some of those kind of things still exist. Uh, we need to figure out how to reduce our healthcare costs. That is a piece that, as a nation, we identify as being a huge challenge, um, whether it be from the perspective of just our, our gross national product, where healthcare is crawling up higher and higher and higher into that percentage. And we've got to figure out how to address that. Um, we continue to we are continuing to fall in the quality of um, life expectancy as a nation compared to other nations around the world. And we need to figure out how to address that. Our, our, we need to figure out how to improve our outcomes. We need to think about how to do things differently. Um, and patients again are still pushing us to say, I can't take a day and a half away from my family to come see a specialist for a follow-up. How can I do this differently? How can I do this better? So just to kind of give you a, a kind of a, a broad picture of telemedicine, um, it really kind of, as I mentioned, kind of started out as kind of the outpatient services. It's now also incorporated some of the inpatient services. This is kind of a standard, on the last couple of slides, kind of a standard listing of what are some of the common ones across the country? Um, in Nebraska Medicine, uh, we have a fairly robust endocrinology uh, program. So uh, an individual, and now they've grown from just one provider to four providers that serves uh, remote locations, focusing in on uh, not only the management of type 2 diabetes, but also in thyroid care and, uh, um, and other aspects uh, related to endocrinology. Mental health has always been a, a service that has been um, well accepted across the country and across uh, providers as being one that, that seems fairly simple to do uh, from the perspective of telehealth. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but it kind of gives you a snapshot of kind of uh, what are some of the things that are going on um, across the country. Here are some, some more. Um, certainly telepharmacy, telehome health, um, because I know that's kind of under the remote patient monitoring, the home monitoring side of things. Um, we will talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but they'll also kind of watch for um, kind of some of the unusual locations that health care is, is and can be delivered as we kind of go through this. Um, some other applications, some of the things we maybe don't think about is necessarily falling under the telehealth umbrella, um, but support groups, speech therapy, um, physical therapy. You know, there are some of those types of things that, um, while it may not seem logical, as well, I need to be able to manipulate, or I need to be able to, you know, really be with that person. I like to tell people, it's like, can you do everything through telehealth? Absolutely not. But I have not come across a specialty yet that you can't do something, even if it's small, even if it's just an introductory visit. If you're sending a patient in for a, a consultation on X, why not introduce them to the place where they're going? 
would be great can be a patient experience kind of uh, uh, opportunity to, to help with that relationship building. So we continue to have across healthcare really um, a really big push on the growth of telehealth. It continues to be uh, an area where people go, okay, I need to figure this out. I need to understand how to use this and what I do every day. And as I mentioned, they're, they're not the only ones that are pushing. It's, it's coming from a variety of avenues. So just to kind of give you a sense of kind of in our area, some of the areas, some of the health systems that have um, telehealth um, networks and programs. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but it's kind of some of the biggies that are in our region. Um, I, they are not um, put out there on any, any list based upon any volume. They're just, a, just a, an awareness kind of uh, list there. And there are more because we're looking at those kinds of big health systems. And there are others that have really kind of come in that aren't necessarily health systems. Um, independent providers are also independent standalone clinics, uh, specialty clinics have really looked at this as an opportunity to grow their business. It's an opportunity really to look at how do you stretch out to a, a population, especially from the administration side of things, <coughs> to a population that you maybe wouldn't have considered um, in your uh, coverage area in the past. Because now there's really no barrier. There's really no distance challenge because um, there's, it's just technology. Certainly there are pieces that make sense from the perspective of um, administrative or from the perspective of relationships. If you're not going to have a referral relationship with the person that you're connecting to, it doesn't probably make a whole lot of sense to establish a telehealth relationship. So kind of thinking through some of those types of things as well. But telehealth has also been growing in uh, for-profit structures. Um, has anybody heard of a company called American Well? So um, that is, um, we talk about direct-to-consumer offerings. So that is, a, I've actually got it on my phone, but I can pull it up at the end if you're interested in kind of seeing. But it's an opportunity to really, um, for low acuity, you've got a scratchy throat, I just don't, I've got a fever, I don't feel well, my ear hurts, or if you've got a child at home, Child has an earache, I know it's an earache. Um, here's the things that I, I know about. You can connect in on your phone, talk to a provider. They can give you some uh, recommendation as to what it might be. If it's appropriate, they would potentially prescribe an antibiotic um, or, or other, you know, whatever ever other recommendations they might have. Um, and it prevents you from having to go to the ED, go to urgent care student health, whatever the case might be, um, and it, it gets you some, some assistance right away as opposed to having to do And there are other things that are going on um, from the perspective of kind of that independent uh, approach. Going back though, I think the most important thing, and I, that's why I reiterate it fair, uh, fairly regularly, is that telehealth is a tool in the delivery of care. It's not different here. It's not a standalone service. It shouldn't be this telehealth department that is over here delivering telehealth services. It needs to be understood that it is a component of the practice, uh, that it is um, a tool in that practice, and that it needs to be structured in a manner that is similar to, if not as, as close to an in-person experience as you can be. So if there are certain things that you wouldn't have done in a clinical environment and an in-person visit, you're not going to do those through telehealth. Uh, if there are certain things that you would have prescribed or, or uh, provided to your patient um, at a clinic, um, at a clinic visit, for example, if there was patient education, if there was um, um, a therapy, um, a recommended therapy that you would have sent home with them, if there was an assisted device that you would have uh, like a band or, or you know something that you would have recommended normally, you need to contemplate how you're going to address that. At a distance because you want to make sure that whatever that care is, you want that to be the same as, as close as possible to that in person experience so that it is not a lower or a lesser care option. Incorporating it into the standard and daily practice is really important because if the provider doesn't recognize it as being a core piece of what they do, even if it's in their, in their structure, 
they're going to view it as being, eh, it's different. I don't need to really think about it too much. But they too need to incorporate that into their structure. And so when you're thinking about that too, I mean, it's not just those pieces, but do you have EMR? How do you share that information across uh, electronic medical record? How do you share that remotely? Okay, do you have to print off an after visit summary? How are you going to do that? Are there pieces and parts of that process at the in-person experience that you need to think through? It can be done, and there are ways to do that, even if it's simply faxing, old-fashioned old fax, um, but it's things to kind of think through. So when you think about telehealth, there are some things that you need to be um, cognizant of and aware of as you're walking through that, that whole process. Um, and these are just kind of some of the highlights ones. I'm not going to dig too deeply into them, but I'm going to highlight them for you uh, a little bit because they are kind of the critical pieces of, of telehealth services. Uh, licensing is, um, is really important, obviously. Um, you need to adhere to um, the provider license structure regardless of whether it's in person or via technology, via telehealth. If your license allows for the delivery of care in a certain manner. That's the way it needs to be done through telehealth. For instance, if you have to be licensed um, in, in a state to deliver care, which is most of the licenses require that if you're practicing in my state, you have to be licensed. So if that's the case, if you're practicing in Iowa through telehealth, meaning that if your patient is located in Iowa, that's the key. It's not where you're physically located as the provider, it's where the patient is located. So if your patient is in South Dakota and you've got a South Dakota license, great. If your patient is in Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, wherever, you have to be licensed in Iowa, Nebraska, or Minnesota. So that's an important, important understanding. The piece that's helpful, um, and it's, this is kind of migrating right now, um, is that there's being, especially for the physician, this is a multi-state physician licensure compact map right now that is in front of you. Um, that compact is designed to uh, help facilitate that license. It's not a, um, a multi-state license. It's not a one-time license that you can then have reciprocity across all different states. It is an opportunity to just facilitate how quickly you can get that license. Now, the nurse compact is different because that is, that is a reciprocity type of a structure. So it all depends on what your licensing structure is. <coughs> so, thank you for <coughs> reminding me of that. Um, credentialing is another piece. Um, if you're practicing in a hospital, you have to be credentialed to practice in that hospital. Uh, and telehealth is no different. So if you're connecting to a hospital for services, you have to be credentialed in that hospital that you're providing services. If you're connecting to a clinic, you may or may not need to be credentialed because it's a clinic, depends on who owns the clinic, how that's, how that's structured. So you really have to be cognizant of what the different response requirements are from the, uh, from the organizational perspective. This one's always the sticky wicket because it is so um, disparate. There are, there is no continuity across any of these from, from the perspective of telehealth reimbursement. Um, they're all over the place. Uh, CMS is certainly, um, uh, CMS is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services. Uh, that's the federal programs um, under Medicare. Uh, telehealth has very unique um, requirements. You have to be in a rural community. That's the first and foremost. That patient has to be rural. If they're not rural, if they're in, a million is still rural. I was going to say, if they're in Sioux City, that's urban. Um, can't provide, they can't be reimbursed for that service. You come up with other ways to, to, to pay for it, but CMS or, or Medicare won't pay for it. Um, also, certain providers, certain locations, I mean, there's, there's very unique uh, qualifications. State Medicaid, believe it or not, is a little more lenient. They are not, usually are not uh, concerned as much about the urban versus rural. If that patient has a need, usually they are a higher need um, economically. And so that's kind of a, a, a thing that they have kind of looked at and said, yeah, we're not going to worry about that piece. But usually, outside of that, Medicaid follows Medicare. Third-party payers are all over the board. 
Blue Cross Blue Shield, Wellmark, you know, I mean, uh, United, they're all over the place. And so you have to really understand from, a, from, a, from the uh, administrative side of things, what is it that your, where is your highest um, reimbursement, your, your volume of uh, patients, where, who are they being served by, who's their insurance coverage, and make sure that certainly those folks, that you're doing it the right way because and it has to be unique to that, to that uh, payer. And then of course you can always have private pay. And not too many people like to do that because it's expensive. And that's usually the highest cost uh, from, a, from a patient's perspective. But it's certainly an opportunity. This gives you a parity map. So when we, when we talk about the third party payers, um, the, uh, um, what's happening kind of across the country is that um, states are realizing that there's got to be a better way to do that piece of things. And they're defining that telehealth should be paid the same as in person, an in-person visit. So if, if you're seen for a, a service in person, and you can be seen for the same service via telehealth, you should be paid in the same, the same way. So more and more states are coming on to that realization. Um, legislatures are passing telehealth parity laws. Um, the challenge with that is that there's no continuity across them either. So they're all over the board as well. Um, each state has, of course, the opportunity to write the law they want or the way they want to write it. So there's uniquenesses across um, across that, and we're seeing we're seeing some of that. So we're, sometimes the the uh, law allows for um, if the service is um, the same, you have to pay. I mean, you have you have to reimburse. They don't say you have to reimburse the same amount. And so that's where part of that challenge happens. So some of the other issues that you need to be kind of thinking through when you're considering uh, telehealth and service development is um, certainly HIPAA. I'm sure you've all been talking about HIPAA uh, at some point or another. Um, and it certainly needs to be an encrypted process. It needs to be very, you know, um, secure from the communication aspect of things, but it's also important to understand that it's not just about the encryption, about the technology, it's about the process too. So if you have a telehealth site um, that is in a, a remote location, it's important to understand that when that patient is being seen, it's important to put them in, a, in an environment that is the same that they would experience if they had come here. So you can't put them in a conference room to be able to have their visit with windows on the outside because somebody will walk by and see who's there and that would not be a secure environment. So it's understanding that it's, it's certainly the technology, but it's also the process. Um, fraud and abuse is another piece of things. Um, there is still an understanding that I cannot, as Nebraska Medicine, buy technology to be placed out in a rural community. Um, be for their use and I pay for it because that's considered a stark violation. That's incentivizing care, incentivizing referrals, and that's not something that can be done. So we have to help the communities understand that yes, you will need to try to figure out how to pay for the technology. The big plus of this is that technology costs come way down. We are now able to really set up a telehealth experience for around $5,000 or less. You know, to be truly um, a telemedicine type of, of an experience. 